escape the destroyer by taking the blood of the lamb and applying it to your family, applying it to your house, hallelujah, and eating the flesh of the lamb inside the house. Can you tell your neighbor, I'm free at last. Free at last, free at last. Thank God Almighty, I am free at last. Well, that's what this is all about. God has sent his only begotten son into the world to free you that you might serve him and live an abundant, rich, and satisfying life. All right. Well, uh, let's go and start with a word of prayer. Can we do that? All right. F Heavenly Father, we thank you so much in the mighty name of Jesus for this opportunity that you've given us to gather on your word. Lord, we pray that you would speak expressly by your spirit and you, Holy Spirit. We pray that you would teach us, that you would speak to us directly, that you would lead us into what we need to know, guide and instruct us and help us to grow. We love you so much and we give you the praise. And I admit, Lord God, I need you. And uh, Father, I receive your strength today. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right. So let's start our journey today in the, book of, in the book of Acts, Acts the 12th chapter. As we talk about, a lot of people talk about Easter, and you hear the term Resurrection Sunday. What does it all mean? Uh, the word Easter actually does appear in the Bible one time. It does appear in the Bible one time, and we're going to tell you about that in just a few moments. Here in Acts, the 12th chapter, you're going to see how really this mention of Easter really uh, encapsulates the whole meaning of Easter. Notice what happens here in this, in Acts, the 12th chapter, verse number four. And it says, and when he had, of uh, the King James Version, and when he had uh, apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quatrions of soldiers to keep him, intending after, somebody help me, Easter. intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Now, the Lord supernaturally delivers Peter from prison. He sends an angel, and an angel, uh, Peter was asleep, he's under heavy guard, and as he was asleep, an angel comes and taps him on the leg and simply says, hey, let's get out of here. And uh, the angel walks him right through the front gate, right to where the church was praying. Supernatural deliverance from bondage. And you'll find this to be the key uh, of Easter. Now, the word Easter really only appears here in the King James Version. And the true uh, definition of the word Easter you'll find is the word Passover. Can you say the word Passover? Passover. Passover. Easter is actually Passover, a celebration of Passover. Now, as a matter of fact, let's go ahead and read that. Same uh, scripture, Acts is 12, chapter, verse number four, out of the New Living Translation. And this is how it reads, same verse. And he imprisoned him, placing him under the guard of four squads of four soldiers each. Herod intended to bring Peter out for public trial after the Passover. After the Passover. After the Passover. So biblically, biblically, when you talk about Easter, you're talking about the Passover. The Passover, biblically. Now, in today's modern day culture, there uh, Easter and Passover or Easter and the resurrection of Christ began like this in the scripture, but now they've gone like that. Now you can celebrate Easter without mentioning Jesus one time. Just like you can celebrate Christmas without mentioning Jesus one time. I can't get a lot of talk in here because of what it has become, because of actually uh, the enemy has skillfully, has skillfully in many places removed Christ from these two major celebrations of the year. And what was meant for freedom, you're going to see this in scripture today if you hang with me, what was meant for freedom in the life of a believer has now been substituted for fun and games. 
Now I'm all for fun. I love fun. I love chocolate. I love presents. Come on, bring them on. <laughs> Hallelujah, bring them on. But what we never need to do is allow the enemy to substitute fun games, chocolates, and events, and trees, and all of that stuff, Christmas time, Easter, all of that stuff for the freedom that God has promised you. Freedom from bondage, freedom from captivity. Because after the eggnog is worn off, if you haven't gotten your freedom, you're still going to be in the same kind of bondage. After we have... After we have hidden all the eggs and gotten all the money and grilled all the hot dogs and the chicken and the barbecue, after we have done all of that and we have stuffed ourselves to the full, where we say, oh, I got to go take a nap. I got to go take a nap. If you're still not free, what difference does it make? Thank you, sister. Got somebody with me today. So what I want to show you today again is that Easter is actually a celebration of Passover. Biblically, in the Bible, Easter is Passover. Well, what is Passover, Pastor? Isn't that some sort of Jewish thing, Jewish holiday? What does that mean to me? I'm so glad you asked, because that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. For that, let's go now to the book of Exodus, where we find out the first Passover and where it came from. So, here we go. Let me tell you a story. Once upon a time... There was a family by the name of Israel. Mama Israel, Daddy Israel, they were all Israel. Here a little bit, there a little bit, Israel. Israel became a large family, and they lived in Egypt. And as long as they were in Egypt, they began to grow and grow and grow and grow. And you know what happened? Uh, they, they originally went there because there was a famine in their land. Nobody had anything to eat. So they told Pharaoh, hey, we'll be your servants if you just feed us because we don't have any money. Pharaoh said, sure, sure, you come on over my house. I'll feed you. You can be my servant. No problem. Years passed. Pharaoh got angry and mad, and then it went from servant to slave. And now the whole family served as slaves beaten and whipped and all of that for 400 years. This family was in slavery. And they were enslaved. They had poverty. They were sick. They had diseases. They were troubled. They were worried. They were depressed. They were frustrated. Death was a part of their living. They were under a hard task master. And how would you like to work for somebody for years without getting any money? Just barely making ends meet. And that's what happened there. As a matter of fact, they cried out to God for 400 years, and then God finally sent them a man. Deliverance came through a, through a man, and some of you know his, his name. His name was Moses. Moses. God sends Moses in to save this family, this huge family that are now in the millions. Still one family, the family of Israel. Now God sends Moses in, and Moses comes in to Pharaoh with a word. And his word is to Pharaoh, let my people go. Somebody has seen the movie. <laughs> the word to Pharaoh is, let my people go. Pharaoh said, I ain't going to do it. No sorry. So God sends a total of 10 plagues or 10 judgments against the land of Egypt, against the gods of Egypt. He sends them, uh, he turns the Nile River to blood to show Pharaoh, look buddy, I mean business and I got power. Secondly, he sends a, a plague of frogs. They had so many frogs, frogs in the, in the kitchen, frogs in the bathroom, frogs in the garage. They had frogs under the bed, frogs in the bed. There were frogs everywhere. To show them Pharaoh, God said, let my people go. But Pharaoh said, still said no. So God sent lice 
into the land. And oh boy, some heads were itching, itching, and scratching, and scratching. Lice, and, and some translations say it was gnats. How many of you ever had to deal with gnats before? Oh, they get on your last nerve. There were lice or gnats everywhere through the land. And finally, uh, God sent them away. But Pharaoh still said, I'm not going to let them go. And then he sent flies in through the land. Oh, they had flies everywhere. Them big old horse flies. And there was buzzing everywhere. Got in the food. Got in everything. But Pharaoh still said, I'm not going to let the people go. And then uh, the Lord uh, struck down the livestock. Much, much of their cattle died, and Pharaoh still said no. And then the Lord sent boils or, or those sores that came upon the Egyptians. They were so many sores and painful sores, and still the Pharaoh said. No, I'm not going to let him go. Uh, but that wasn't the end of it. Then the Lord sent hail. These big old ice balls start falling out of the sky and hitting people on the head and, and coming through the roof. But still Pharaoh said, no. Moses said, let my people go. God said it. Still Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to do it. And then the Lord said, all right, I'm going to send locusts in the land. And locusts ate up all the crops. But still Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to do it. Come on, Pharaoh. And then the Lord sent darkness through the land. It was dark in the land. No sunlight, no moonlight, no starlight. It was just dark in the land of Egypt. But the people of God had light in Goshen. There was light over there, but there was darkness over there in the land of Egypt. Still, Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let you go until they got down to the last plague, the last judgment, death of the firstborn. Moses simply said to Pharaoh, Pharaoh, look, buddy, this is the last one. This is the last draw. And you're not going to like this one. I'm paraphrasing here, by the way. You're not going to like this one. God said, unless you let the people go, the firstborn of every house is going to die. And Pharaoh said, no, I'm not going to let you go. No, I'm not going to do it. This was, the, this was the last plague in Egypt. And the Lord was using this as a sign or symbol to the Egyptians, a sign or symbol rather to uh, the Hebrews, or that is to say the children of Israel and to us today how he would bring the children of Israel out of bondage because they were in bondage to Pharaoh for 400 years. They cried out from pain and agony, get me out of this trouble. They cried out. I'm not sure how many of you have ever cried yourself to sleep at night worried and, and aggravated, don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You, you're in trouble. You're in a bad situation. And some of the things we've gotten ourselves into, you know, we had good intentions. We were trying to do the best we could with what we had, but then we got into a bad fix, a bad situation, and we couldn't get out of it. Same thing with the children of God. And so they're here, and Moses tells Pharaoh, look, it's coming. Unless you let the people of God go, people are going to die in Egypt by the millions. Pharaoh still said, no, I'm not going to do it. So God said, there is a way for me to protect my people. Because even though the plague was coming, it would still affect the people of God too. It was coming through the land. God said, there is a way for me to protect my people as I judge the land of Egypt. How is God going to do that? Well, let's look now in uh, let's look now in Exodus twelve, verse. We'll start for time's sake. You can read the entire chapter of Exodus twelve chapter. You can read the entire chapter and get the full thing. I'm just going to give you the cliff notes here because of the time we have today. Is that okay? Amen. Yes. Verse three says, "Tell the." This is out of the um, New International Version. It says here in verse three, Exodus twelve, verse three. Tell the whole community of Israel that on the 10th day of this month, each man is to take a lamb for his family, one for each household. This deliverance that you'll see starts with every man taking a lamb for his household. 
every head of household, go get a lamb, a lamb without spot, a lamb without wrinkle, and you bring that lamb into your house. And something's going to happen. Let's look down to verse number 21. Uh, verse 21 said, Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said unto them, Draw out and take you a lamb according to your families and kill the Passover. Kill the Passover here. So here we are instituting the Passover. And ye shall take a bunch of hyssop, that's like a plant there, and dip it in the blood that is in the basin, that is the lamb's blood. You dip the, uh, dip the hyssop, uh, when, when they bunch them together, it's kind of like a, kind of like a paintbrush, and you, and you dip it in the basin. The basin held the blood, because when they killed the lamb, and uh, its blood drained out, drained out of his body into a bowl. And he said, I want you to take the hyssop, take the plant, and I want you to dip it uh, in the, the basin. And he says, and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. The lintel is the top of the door. And then you have the two side posts. He says, I want you to strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin. And none of you shall go out at the door of the house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians. And when he sees the blood upon the lintel and on the two side posts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not suffer the destroyer to come in unto your houses to smite you. And ye shall observe this thing for an ordinance to thee and to thy sons forever. Notice something here. He says a destroyer is going to come through the land. Destruction is going to come through the land. It's going to happen. He's already told Pharaoh about it. Pharaoh said, no, it's going to happen. And he said, there's only one way for you guys to be safe. He did not say, Moses and Aaron, you guys go and I want you to take blood and I want you to uh, strike it on everybody's household. No, he doesn't say that. He tells every head of household, he tells every husband, every head of household, if the husband's not there, then whoever is the head of the household, I want you to take a lamb and I want you to kill the lamb and they're actually also going to eat the flesh of the lamb in the house, and then you're going to take the blood and you're going to strike it on the outside, not the inside of the house, but on the outside of the house. You're going to strike it onto the two side posts and the top post so that the home is covered by the blood of the lamb. Now, why is that important? Because all of this speaks about Jesus. The Bible declares that Jesus is the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sins of the world. We'll see that in a few moments. But notice, at the time of crucifixion, I wonder how many crosses were there and during the time of crucifixion, somebody knows that there were three crosses there. In the time of crucifixion, uh, there was blood shed on the left and blood shed on the right and blood shed in the middle. Well, that's the same thing the Lord told them to do there. He said, take the lamb's blood and strike it, strike it, strike it. This alludes to Jesus. And Jesus is the lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. So the father was given them a sign or a symbol even back then he told them to get a lamb without blot without blemish that was Jesus Christ and he says I want you to keep him there and sacrifice that lamb as a matter of fact of the time of the Passover sacrifice was in the evening Jesus Christ was also crucified in the evening he is the Passover lamb the Passover lamb here in the book of Exodus kept the people saved as long as they were in the house. If you went outside the house, destruction 
sin came upon you. But Jesus is our Passover lamb, and now he gives us this thing called communion we'll look at shortly. He still says, eat my flesh, he's a lamb, and drink my blood. But now, instead of striking the blood, he says, drink it, which means that you are covered from destruction everywhere you go, not just in the house. Are you hearing? So he gives us this sign or this symbol that all points to the Lamb of God, that all points to Jesus. And as long as every head of the household was faithful to bring a lamb home, as long as every head of the household prepared the flesh of the lamb for his families to eat, and as long as they, um, uh, they took the blood and they struck it upon the side posts and top posts of their house, their family would be safe from the destroyer. Isn't that awesome? So the Bible says that the Lord said, he said, the destroyer is coming. And when the destroyer that's going through the land, when the destroyer sees the sign of the blood, it will what? Pass over the house. When it sees the sign of the blood, it will pass over. Now, this word Passover, it does carry the meaning of going up and going over. But if you look in the root uh, Hebrew text, you'll find that the word Passover also means to limp. What? It means to limp. It means to halt, which means that this is not a, a fast thing going through. It is a stop. 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 The word Passover here, the, the root word of it does mean to dance. There are several definitions of it. So this is a dance of joy. And, and some commentators also say that the root, a root word of Passover also means that God would take his wings and he would cover the home that he would cover the home, that he would protect the home from the destroyer that's going through the land. So is there, how, is this, how does this relate to us today? Is there still destruction in the land? Absolutely. All you have to do is watch the 6 o'clock news or 12 o'clock news. Look at your Facebook post. You see that there are people dying left and right. There are home invasions. There are terrorist attacks. There are diseases. Every other week sounds like there's some of the disease. There are earthquakes. There are tornadoes. Destruction is everywhere. There are mass shooting at schools and at the malls. It's everywhere. How can we escape the destroyer? By taking the blood of the lamb and applying it to your family, applying it to your house, hallelujah, and eating the flesh of the lamb inside the house. Amen. Well, how can I do that? How can I eat the flesh of the lamb? Jesus said, and we'll look at this in a moment, Jesus is the word of God that was made flesh. In John, the first chapter, so that means to me, if I take that Bible, and if I open that Bible, and I, as I read, just simply read that Bible, read the book uh, before my family, I'm feeding them the word of God. I'm feeding them the flesh of the lamb. And as I declare his blood over my family, they're being preserved. And as I take communion with me, I just take it home and, and, and give it to my family. And we honor the, honor the Lord's table. We honor his body and his blood, effectively, again, preserving us from destruction that is to come, that is coming in the land. Hallelujah to the lamb of God. So not only are we talking today about the resurrection and why it's important, also talking about how to keep your family safe yes, yes. from the destruction that's coming in the land. Now listen to me. The Bible says here that the Lord will send the destroyer, that the destroyer will come, judgment coming through the land. You say, well, that's not nice. Why would God allow destroyer to go through the land, and, and a lot of people get killed. What did the Egyptians do to deserve this, to deserve all of this? It's, they had to enslave the people, but surely there was something else. You know what? You, you pretty got a pretty good head on your shoulder. You're absolutely right. 
Let's go now to the book of, same book of Exodus. Let's go to the beginning. Exodus, the first chapter. Exodus, the first chapter. And see, while you, let me tell you, as you're in Christ, if you're a believer in Jesus, you better thank the Lord that you, that you will never get what you truly deserve. Payback is a mm mm. Are you hearing what I'm saying to you? Jesus, as he was on that cross, took the punishment and the wrath of God for your sin and my sin. Because of that, God is not angry with you. God is not mad at you because Jesus took all the wrath and the punishment that you and I were supposed to receive. He took it upon himself. Just like if you're, we have kids in the classroom. And uh, one kid is so, I mean, just so mean, little bully-looking kid. And this bully kid that nobody likes threw a piece of paper, and the teacher's writing on the board, and they threw a piece of paper, uh, and hit the teacher on the back of the head. The teacher fell out unconscious. That was a wicked piece of paper. Teacher fell out on the floor, finally got up, Teacher said, who did that? Who hit me with this paper? Everybody was scared of the bully. Nobody wanted to say. But there was this nice kid in the class who never did anything wrong ever. He raised his hand and said, teacher, I did it. I'll take the punishment for him. And so that kid got expelled. That kid, some other stuff happened to him. That kid was written up, but the other kid went free. The nice kid paid the debt for the other kid, so the other kid could go free. The guilty kid was then called innocent, and the innocent kid was then called guilty. Well, that's in, that's in effect what Jesus did for us. Somebody had to die for our sins. The Bible declares that the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus, someone had to die. The Father said, I love humanity. I love them, and I want them to come home. But I cannot circumvent or go beyond the laws that I have written. Some, they die, or rather they have committed sin. Somebody must die. They must die. Jesus raised his hand in class and said, Father... I'll, I'll die the death for them. I'll take their sin into myself so that they can go free. Now all those that believe in what Jesus Christ has done can enter into the rest that God has provided, can enter into the freedom that God has provided through the body of Jesus Christ. Are you hearing me today? Oh, we're almost done. So why would God do this? Payback is a hmm-hmm. Exodus, the first chapter, verse number 22. Look at this out of the New Living Translation. Exodus 1, verse 22 out of the New Living Translation. It says, Then Pharaoh gave this order to all his people. Throw every newborn Hebrew boy into the Nile River, but you may let the girls live. So generations ago, God didn't forget. There was weeping and crying and lamenting by many of the Israelites, the Hebrews, as their baby boys picked up by the leg and drowned in the Nile River. There was weeping through the land. And the father never forgot that. And so now was the time for payback. The Bible says, you will reap what you sow. You've heard the term even in the world that says, what goes around will come around. Well, now it's time for Pharaoh to get his comeuppance. It's the time. Judgment is coming through the land. Just like it is today. How many innocent babies? They may not be thrown in the river, but how many of them are thrown in the trash can? Does God forget? Is judgment going to happen in the land? Absolutely. Will you be saved from it? Well, that's up to you. 
God will provide a way out. He will provide a way of escape for his people. Now, I want to show you something. As a result of this first Passover, there are several things that happen, and we're beginning to close. As a result of this Passover, several things happen. As a matter of fact, seven things happen in particular as a result of this Passover. One, the people were safe, were saved from destruction. As, as that enemy went through, leaping over or limping, should I say limping, going over as the Lord dancing before the people of the Lord, covering their houses with his wings under his feathers, protecting them from destruction. As all that was going on, Egyptian homes, they were crying because their children, their children were dead, were dying, were, were had, dead, their, had died, their firstborn died, just like the children of Israel cried so many hundreds of years before. That was going on. So one thing, the people of God were divinely protected too. This blood on their doors identified them as being children of God. Three, uh, they were freed after this happened. Pharaoh gladly said, y'all get out of here now. Finally, he let the children of God go free. He said, go. So three, they were freed. Number four, they had favor. God told the children of Israel, go and borrow from the Egyptians. And they didn't know why they were doing it. But the children of Israel, they went and asked him, hey, let me have your jewels. Okay, uh, let me have your gold. Okay, let me let, let me uh, yeah, let, 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 uh, 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 let me borrow your cow too. Okay, they let them borrow. They let them borrow. So when the children of Israel went out, they went out filthy rich, yeah, 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 yeah. filthy rich. Amen. As a result of this Passover, you say, but look, that's not fair. How are you going to borrow something and not pay them back? Listen. The children of Israel work 400 years without salary. They were finally getting their severance package. They were finally able to go out. Generations of abuse, generations of never getting paid. Now they got paid as they went out. So part of Passover, again, is divine, divine protection. It is freedom. God setting you free from captivity. It is favor. It is wealth. It is also divine health. It is divine health. You'll see this. And their enemies were afraid of them. This is all under the Passover. Well, your enemy, instead of you running from him, he's whoo, running from you. Let me show you this, this account here in the book of Psalms, Psalm 105, verse 36 through 38. Are y'all still with me today? Amen. Listen to this, Psalm 105, verse 36 through 38. This is an account of what happened. And it said, he smote also all the firstborn in their land, the chief of all, the chief of all their strength. He, uh, he brought them forth also with silver and gold. And there was not one feeble person among their tribe. Not one person. That person that was in 80s and 90s, nobody was feeble. Not one was sickly. They had divine health. In verse 38, Egypt was glad when they departed, for the fear of them fell upon them. That devil was glad to give you. Take whatever you want. Just get out of here. Are you hearing? Yes. So last, how does this apply to me today? I'm so glad you asked so I can let you go because I'm sure you're anxious to go out and serve. That was good for them. They got out of their Egypt. They got out of their bondage. But what about me? I'm, I still have a lot of things going on. There is uh, addictions and there's poverty. There's sickness. There's disease. There's trouble. There's pain. There's depression. There is worry. There's frustration. There's confusion. There is sin. Pastor, I need a checkup from the neck up. Got some things are going on. How can that help me today? Well, we talked a little bit about it before. Let's look at Matthew, the 26th chapter. Matthew 26, verse 17 through 29. And this is where we'll stop here. Tell your neighbor, whew, he's almost done. 
Don't forget to say the whew. He's almost done. You can go ahead and ask him for a moment. Go ahead and ask him what you're going to ask him about food and what you're going to eat and all that. What you're thinking about. Go ahead and check your watches or whatever. Go ahead and go get all get all that out of, out of the way. Are you? Yeah, he's he's that kind of yeah that one yeah. Are you ready? Amen. Matthew twenty six verse seventeen through twenty nine. Listen to this. It says, "Now the first day of the feast of unleavened bread." Again. Now the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus, saying unto him, Where wilt thou that we prepare for thee to eat thee? To eat the Passover. Remember in Exodus, God said, you guys are going to keep doing this forever. This is a feast. This is a celebration. I want you to keep on doing this forever as a, as a memorial for what happened this day. And so here in the New Testament, they're still doing it. And even Jesus himself celebrating the Passover. The disciples asked him, where do you want us to set set the Passover up? Look at verse number 18. And he said, go into the city to such a man and say unto him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus had appointed them, and they made ready thee. They made ready the Passover. The Passover. That Thursday night. Thursday night. This is what we call the Lord's Supper. You remember that famous picture of Jesus sitting with the disciples at the table? That was a Passover meal. That was Passover. They were eating the Passover. Isn't that something? They were eating the Passover. Jesus keeping the Passover. And then, of course, he talks about betrayal. So that was Thursday night. Friday, they hung him on the cross. He died the very next day. And then, three days, he's up out of the grave. Are you you hearing this? As they were having this Passover meal, Jesus said something that we will never forget. Look at verse 26. He says, and as they were eating, and as they were eating, eating what? The Passover meal, eating the eating of the lamb. Are you hearing me? While they're eating the Passover, while they were eating, Jesus took bread and break it. Rather, Jesus took bread and blessed it and break it and gave eat and gave it to the disciples and said, What? Take eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom." They may not have believed, but the very next day he was going to die, but he was prophesying to them, we're going to be together again. I shall be alive, I shall be resurrected, and we will eat together. So here, Jesus identifies himself as the Passover lamb. No longer will you eat that little lamb that come out of the field, I am the Passover lamb. I am the lamb of God. Now eat my flesh. Now instead of taking my blood and the lamb's blood and dipping it in a basin and striking upon your houses so that you are only safe when you are at home, now you're going to drink my blood and my blood will cover this house, cover this house so that you are safe where every, everywhere you go from every destroyer, from destruction from perversion, from the work of the enemy, from the wrath and the judgment of God. You are safe and you are secure. Jesus is our Passover lamb. So again, during the evening, during the time of evening sacrifice, they killed him. Or rather, he allowed himself to die. And he rose from the dead. And this resurrection proves that God received the sacrifice. 
And now all those who would believe in Jesus, God said, I'll forgive you of your sin. It will be as if you had never done it. Under this new way that Jesus has, has given us, you don't have to be right before you come to God. God will make you right when you come to him. Some people believe, well, I'll come to God, you know, as soon as I stop drinking, I'll come. As soon as I stop sleeping around, I'll come. As soon as I stop this, as soon as I stop that, then I'll come, you know. So they believe if they make themselves right, make themselves good enough, then God will like them. But let me tell you how stupid, I'm sorry, how ignorant that is. <laughs> please, please forgive my French, I'm sorry. That's just like somebody would say, I can't go to the emergency room because I'm bleeding. I can't go to the emergency room because my leg has fallen off. I can't go see the doctor because I'm still hurting. Does that make any sense to you? Doesn't make any sense to me at all. So you want to make yourself better first and then go to the hospital. No, the Father says, come to me as you are. Come to me as you are. I'll receive you just as you are. And then as you're in his emergency room, he'll fix you up. He'll heal you. He'll make you whole. All you got to do is come. For the children of Israel, all they had to do is simply believe. I mean, Moses, this lamb is going to take care of my family. All you got to do is believe and you'll enter in. With the children of Israel, they went out by the blood of that lamb. With us, we enter into the kingdom of God by the blood of the lamb of God, the blood of Jesus. We declare the blood of Jesus over our families, over our households. We declare that we are safe. We declare that we are secure. And the Lord has forgiven us so completely. It is as if we had never thrown that piece of paper at the teacher's head. You get that when you. It is as if you've never done it. The father was in Christ Jesus, not counting people's sins against them. But he said, all I want you to do is just come back in relationship with me. I'll help you clean up the rest. Let me show you one last scripture and then we'll really be done. I hope you're with me today. Look at John, John the third chapter, verse 16 and 17. Very familiar scripture. I want to get this home to you, and then we're going to pray. John the third chapter, verse 16 and 17. Here it is. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that rather, this is out of the um, uh, NIV, so let me read it. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not, did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him, but that, I'm sorry, but to save the world through him. So God's not counting your sins against you. You are counting your sins against you. But the father said, I'm not mad at you. Come home. Just come home. And the Lord has helped you straighten everything out. Don't allow the enemy to lie to you, to think that you have to be good enough before God can receive you. As a matter of fact, it is your sins that qualify you for the Lord's righteousness. You have to be a sinner. and You have to know that you are a sinner. You have to know that you're messed up so that God can give you the righteousness that he paid for through the body of Jesus. But if you think that you're already right, if you think that you have never sinned, you've never done anything wrong, then you can never receive what God has done for you because you've already done it yourself. What I'm telling you today is that the Father is offering you an opportunity to be made right in His sight. He's offering you an opportunity past your sins. has nothing to do with it now. If you only choose to believe, He'll receive you. Father, let's pray. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name for the word that you've given us today. And Lord, I pray for everyone here under the sound of my voice and everyone that is watching and listening. Father, I pray that at this very moment that you will convict our hearts and that you will assure us that Jesus is the Savior of the world. It is him 
that washes away our sins. It is through his sacrifice that we are safe from destruction, that we are safe from the wrath of God, that we are secure. And Father, I pray today that as you deal with your people, that they will receive you as their Lord and Savior. Father, I pray today is that day of change and deliverance. And my friends right now, everyone that is here and everyone that is watching, if you have not known Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, and you want to pray this prayer with me, then come on, let's pray this prayer together so that you may be safe and secure so that you can live and serve the Lord. Let's pray. So say with me, Father, I come to you a sinner in need of a Savior. I ask you to forgive me of all my sins and make me whole and pure. I receive Jesus as my master, my Lord, and my Savior. I believe that he is alive forevermore, and I ask him to come into my heart. Live in me, Lord Jesus. Make me yours, and I will serve you all the days of my life as you show me how. Master, my Lord, and my Savior, I believe that he is alive forevermore, and I ask him to come into my heart. Live in me, Lord Jesus. Make me yours, and I will serve you all life. You show me how. I am yours. You, I believe. I want to save you.